Hey there, welcome back to Stories from the Mortuary. I'm your host, Aulani Santiago, here as always to administer your daily dose of death. I do apologize that I've been a little bit absent both on social media and as far as posting a new episode. Um, Just to give you guys some background, in case you haven't seen on my Instagram, I have been dealing with a domestic violence incident of my own. I've recently separated from an abusive boyfriend who was emotionally abusive as well as physically and uh, psychologically abusive. It's really taken a toll on me the past two years, especially because it is my second abusive relationship. And I just wanted to take this moment to reach out to you, the listeners, and tell you that if you or someone you know is going through any type of abuse, and it does not mean that they have to put your hands on you, it could be the way that they demean you in front of other people, or when you're not in front of other people, it could be that they break your things or make you so afraid to be honest with yourself or honest with them for fear of them lashing out. If you're going through this, please know that you're not alone. I think that's the hardest thing to remember when you're going through this. It feels like no one could possibly understand what you're going through. And there definitely are going to be people who don't understand. And that's okay. Not everyone goes through something so traumatic. But it doesn't mean that what you're going through is normal. It doesn't mean that what you're going through also is completely out of the ordinary because other people go through variations of uh, intimate partner abuse and it is not specific to any gender or sexual orientation it can happen to anyone regardless of race religion um you know whether they have money or not it can happen to anybody so i wanted to take this moment to at least um, once again give the number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. It is 800-799-7233. If you're unable to call, you can also send a text from your phone and text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 88788. If you ever need to go on the website, they have a lot of resources available for you. And I just can't emphasize this enough. You are not alone. And although right now I'm not in that better phase of it's getting better, I know that it does. And it will. It will for you too. Today's episode is going to deviate a bit from the norm, so instead of telling you about a case this week, I will actually be publishing an interview that I just had with retired NYPD detective Vic Ferrari. He's published half a dozen books on his experience being in the NYPD, so I'll be linking those books um, on Amazon that you can purchase both as a softcover book or an ebook. I'll post that in the show notes. Now, real quick, uh, I won't be discussing a missing indigenous woman today. I just haven't had the time to be able to fully write out kind of an intro script, which is why this introduction has been far more unscripted than I normally do. But I do want to shout out our first review is in. So shout out to Sinner22. I think it's Sinner. It's S-Y-N-N-E-R. So Sinner22, thank you so much. I'm sorry I didn't shout you out earlier. I actually didn't realize that you had left this review uh, in you know the last week of August. Thank you so much for the five stars and your kind words. So if you can reach out to me through Instagram at storiesftmortuary or through my email, storiesfromthemortuary at gmail.com, uh, let's connect because I am currently working on designing some stickers to start selling to y'all. And I'd really love to just send you one for free as a thank you for leaving such an honest and kind review. And for the rest of the listeners, I am now opening it up to the rest of y'all to, if you can, and if you feel so inclined, to leave a five-star rating on iTunes or 
Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to go ahead and leave a review, um, you don't even have to talk about the episode. You can just say that you like french fries or something of that nature. Um, but it would really help get the podcast really up and off the ground. We are actually coming up on our one year anniversary and Halloween. I don't know what I have planned for that episode yet, but I will get back to you guys as soon as I can. So without further ado, let's get to this week's stories from the mortuary. Are you equal parts cute and spooky? Do you like horror movies and celebrate Halloween year round? Visit wearecrimsonclover.com for all of your spooky needs. They have home decor, kitchenware, and clothing that'll suit all of your ghostly needs. I just ordered a Faces of Death shirt, and I'm very excited to wear it to work. Use code Miss underscore Memento underscore Mori with two eyes. That is M-S underscore M-E-M-E-N-T-O underscore M-O-R-I-I for 10% off of your total purchase at checkout. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you doing today? Not bad. Not bad. Awesome. So uh, is your name, your name's Vic? Yeah. Awesome. Vic Ferrari is a really cool name. Thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) <laughs> awesome thanks so much for setting up this meeting with me i really appreciate you reading out uh reaching out and everything so i would love to hear just a little bit about how you started with the nypd and everything okay are we are we going live I uh, yep and i have it recording already okay um my name is vic ferrari i'm a retired 20-year member of the new york city police department uh as far as i, I grew up in the bronx as far as i can remember i always wanted to be a police officer and later a detective by the age of five, my mother used to take me to the movie theater, which was around the corner from a police station. And when we would go to the movies, I would run up to the police cars and stare inside and look at the equipment. <laughs> I said to myself, one day I'm going to be one of those guys chasing the bad guys. And then by age 10, 11 years old, my friends and I used to go up to the local post office and steal wanted posters. And we'd be running around the neighborhood with a wanted poster for some guy wanted for a bank robbery in Louisiana. And we're walking around the Bronx, walking into delis. That kind of looks like, <laughs> you know, little boy stuff. So by, <laughs> by age 20, I took the, uh, the, the exam. I passed by 21. I was in the police academy. I worked primarily my whole career in the Bronx in Manhattan. I worked in various units, plain clothes. I worked in Ma- Manhattan North Narcotics for a while. And then my last 10 years, I was a detective in the NYPD's auto crime division. So we handled anything with chop shops, stolen vehicles, exporting stolen vehicles out of the country, changing vehicle identification numbers for resale, and any scam you could possibly think of, of why, you know, why someone would steal a car and what they're going to do with it. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned some uh, morgue stories that you have. And since I, I do host stories from the mortuary, I would love to hear all that. I uh, A little bit on me before we get into it is that I'm in mortuary school right now. And while I'm doing a funeral services pathway. So I will get an embalming license slash funeral director license after. My plan is to continue with a medical degree so that I can get into forensic pathology. So a a similar vein, you know, we're two different people trying to still solve the crime, still help people. So yes, please tell me about the morgue. I would love to hear about it. Okay, so I'm in the police academy. The NYPD hires in bulk. So at any given time, a police academy class can be anywhere from 500 recruits to 2,000 or more. So I was in a mid-sized group. I was in a group of about 1,200, and we were broken down into classrooms of 30. So one day, our police science instructor tells us, he was a very matter-of-fact kind of guy, and he says, tomorrow we're going to the morgue. He says, you know, you're going to you know, you're going to see dead bodies through the course of your NYPD career. Just prepare for it. And he says, there's going to be people working there. And he goes, I'm not talking about the the, the, uh, the doctors that are are doing autopsies. He goes, there's people that work there. They're ghouls. So we started laughing. (laughs) When you go in there, they're going to mess with you. They're going to drop trays. They're going to walk past you with body parts. They're going to try to shake you up. He goes, ignore them. He goes, they're ghouls. So I thought it was funny. (laughs) <laughs> so the following morning, they they take it was like a school trip. You see, with little kids, 
They walk us down to Bellevue Hospital, which was the morgue at the time in Lower Manhattan. Now, I mean, New York City has 9 million people packed into it. You're going to have a lot of dead people. Some causes natural, some unnatural. So if, you know, when the medical examiner responds to, to a death, if he marks it suspicious, they're going to the morgue. And, you know, ob- obvious ones is gunshots and then not so obvious. Someone in perfect health just drops dead in the house. Like, what happened to this person? Were they poisoned? What, yeah. what caused them to, to expire long before they should? So we go into the basement of Bellevue Hospital, and it was nothing I was expecting. I was expecting, like, something out of the television show, Quincy, where there's, like, two gurneys. It looked like <laughs> yeah. a jiffy loop. It, it was, like, eight or ten slabs, metal slabs, and between each slab is a produce scale. Like when you were a kid, your mother would weigh a green pepper in the produce oh, scale. for the organs and stuff. Yeah, yeah. for the organs. <laughs> and they were going. So you had like 10 slabs and you probably had four or five autopsies going at once. We're like, what the fuck is this? And I mean, <laughs> they're going. It's like, we don't even exist. You know what I mean? We walked in like children and we don't even exist. And... There, there were people there that expired for a variety of reasons. And the first thing our police science instructor did was he passed out a little thing of Vicks uh, mental vapor rub and oh, he goes, yeah. put this under your nose. He goes, it'll mask the smell of death. Because even though these people are refrigerated, you know, some of them might've been in a car or, you know, in an apartment somewhere and oh, they're yeah. past rigor mortis and now their gases are starting to come out. And you, you're just basically de- decomposing. <laughs> so we're, we're watching this, it's like, you know, I remember there was um, there was a woman, a pregnant woman that died of an overdose, and they oh, opened her up. I mean, they use basically it's the same tool they use it at, at Midas Muffler or a muffler shop. It's called a wizard tool or a cutting tool. I guess now you see like thieves stealing catalytic converters with it. It's it's a it's a fast moving blade, and basically what they do is they cut the back of your scalp. It's like something out of a movie. And they pull your face out front and they pluck your brain right out of your head and they weigh it in a scale. And I, the doctor is like, okay, the brain weighs 3.5 pounds. He's not that smart. And, make, make it go. <laughs> and the ghoul is writing things down, which I didn't call them ghouls. So if there's people here that work in a morgue, it's not me. It was my police. <laughs> so don't get too pissed off at me. He's going down the line, do you know, work do, the different doctors working on different autopsies. But I remember the pregnant female, they cut her open and basically pulled a small baby out with the umbilical cord and weighed her. And I I, I just weighed the, the small child in, in the produce scale and we're like, holy shit. Like it was scarier than anything I'd ever seen in a scary movie. Oh yeah. And on another slab, there was a couple of detectives. It was a guy that had been duct taped and shot like multiple times. And he, he's, he makes a crack to the uh, to the, uh, the the ME. He goes, what do you think? And he goes, suspicious suicide. And they all burst out laughing because <laughs> guy was shot like 11 times tape. and he duct tapes like hog guy. He was suspicious suicide. <laughs> so that was my entry into the morgue. And the funny thing is that one of the MEs come and they explain what to look for when you go with old people that die, just don't write it off that they died, you know. Yep look around the apartment, see what kind of pills they're taking, et cetera, et cetera. As we go to leave, we get in this freight elevator. There's 30 of us in there with a police science instructor. And one of the ghouls walks in with like a dirty coat. You know, he's got body fluids on him. This is 1987. And the elevator door shuts and we're going up and you could hear a pin drop. And I turned to my police and science instructor and I said, whatever his name was, I go, sir, is he a ghoul? And the whole elevator exploded into laughter. And then the ghoul was like motherfucker me under his breath and the door opens up and we got out of there. But, you know, when you're on patrol in the NYPD, you're exposed to death quite a bit. Uh, I got another really interesting morgue story. If you want to hear the homicide and how the person got to the morgue, I can tell you that one. Absolutely. Go for it. So it's the, it's the early nineties and uh, we get called out. It comes over as a cardiac. So we go up, it's a hot, Friday or Saturday night in the Bronx towards the end of the summer, probably about this time of year, September. We go into this building. It's a six story walk up. As my partner and I are going up the stairs, we hear crying and screaming and wailing. So we go into the apartment. I'm just swimming past people, moving people out of the way to see what's going on in here. As I get to, it's a galley kitchen, but as I'm pushing through people, I see a pair of legs on the floor. 
So I get into the kitchen. There's a woman laid out on her back, stabbed multiple times, like 20, 30 times. Oh my God. The son is on top of her and he's screaming, wailing, mom, 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 mom. So we get him off of her. And, you know, when you cut your finger, blood is bright red. Mm -hmm. But over time, when it's exposed to oxygen, it turns brown or a rust color. The cold kitchen was just blood all over the walls, blood on the phone. So it was obvious she had expired hours before. So we bring the son into the living room and uh, just, I mean, we weren't putting the screws to the guy. We were just asking him simple questions. Like, when was yeah. the last time you saw your mother? And all of a sudden he goes from hysterical crying to cold and starts repeating the question. So I go, when was the last time you saw your mother? When was the last time I saw my mother? Looks up, I don't know, three, four hours ago. Were you having problems with her or anything? Was I having problems with her? So now it's starting to like, why is he getting these like turning into a weirdo? <laughs> As we start looking around, so the apartment's ransacked. It looked like a burglary at first, but when you start looking around the apartment, you start realizing it's staged. When a burglar breaks into your house or your apartment, they're on the clock. They don't want to hang around there unless they're a lunatic. They're pulling out drawers and dumping shit on the floor and they're going through it as quickly as possible to go into the next drawer. They're not dumping your, the contents of a drawer out and putting the drawer back in. No. They don't have time for that and they're not neat. They don't give a shit. Also, <laughs> in the living room, her bag was dumped, up, up, dumped upside down and then placed right side up next to it, which was no, odd. They wouldn't put they it back. They just dumped that bag and chuck it right. And yeah. the credit cards were left behind. And this is in the early 90s before, you know, people realized you could track credit cards. So that was unusual. So the detectives take him to the precinct. We process the crime scene. And that night, they know he knows more than he said. You know, he's the main suspect. They're not ready to put the cuffs on him yet. But they know he knows more than he's talking, than he's letting on. The victim had three brothers that lived in the building next door. And the guy wanted to stop. The guy didn't. Uh, the, the son didn't want to stop, didn't want a lawyer, but he wanted to stop the interview. He's like, it's getting late. I want to go home. So at that point, it's like, he's not asking for a lawyer. Let's let him go. Because okay. if we really push it, he might say lawyer. And then we, we lose a statement. Exactly. So the three brothers asked the three, uh, the woman's uh, brothers asked the detectives, what's going on? They go, listen, talk to your nephew. We're not saying he did it. You know, don't, don't, you know, don't, don't form a posse and hang this guy upside down and waterboard him. But he definitely knows more than he's saying. So, if, you know, if you can get anything out of him, so they all leave. In the NYPD, the first responding cop or cops that get to a homicide, before that body gets taken by the medical examiner's office, you've got to tie a little cardboard tag to their toe. It's called a 95 tag or a toe tag. And it would yeah. have my name on it it would have my information and it would have the deceased information on it. So the body leaves. In the NYPD, the following morning, that cop that filled out that 95 tag has to go to the morgue to make sure they didn't screw things up and that body matches that toe tag at the morgue the following morning. I was up all night, I worked till four or five in the morning, got two hours sleep. I go, so in the Bronx, the morgue was at at the time uh, in the basement of Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx. So okay. I go to that morgue, skeleton crew, it's like some young guy working there, he's like 25 years old. I give him the name of the deceased. I think I was in uniform, if memory serves me correctly. I give him the name of the deceased and he goes into a big like commercial refrigerated room. It wasn't like on TV, like you see the sliding drawers. It was just hey. a big refrigerator room. I think they were between yeah. morgues or something. But anyway, he walked into a big refrigerated room. He comes wheeling out a gurney, sheet over a deceased, he pulls the sheet off and it's a black guy with a beard. I go, what are you fucking kidding me? I said, it's a female Hispanic, here's her name. He goes, oh, puts the sheet back over the deceased black guy and wheels him back into the room, right? I'm waiting a couple of minutes. He wheels out another body, pulls the sheet off and it's an old white guy. I'm like, listen, dude, I didn't come here to see everybody that died in the Bronx wow, land. I'm wow. to see and I give the name. So he goes in again and says, no, you know what? I'm going in. So I walk into this room and it was an another thing, it was like a horror show. I walk in there and there's gotta be 10 gurneys, right? All over the place with sheets on them. But her sheet had like, I could tell blood and body fluids on it. Oh, seeping oh, through it, yeah. Tag. I look, I see the name, I pull the sheet up, I go, that's her. So I positively ID'd her from the night before. Meanwhile, back 
The detectives decide they get up bright and early. They're going to make another run at this guy before he asks for a lawyer. They're going to go to his building. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're going to take the fight to him. The two detectives, thank goodness, were Hispanic. They get to they get to the building, and it was a large building with a large hallway. And when they got when they hit the hallway, they heard screaming in Spanish. What had happened was Sunny Boy was trying to leave, and the three brothers showed up in the hallway and go, "Where are you going?" Like, what's going on with this? What happened with our sister? And the detectives hung back, but they didn't see them. They got behind a stairwell. They hid somewhere. And they overheard him admit that he stabbed his mother to death. And what happened was the son got hooked on crack. And the mother was tired of bailing him out of trouble. And he was stealing. He was living with her. He's selling her jewelry. He's stealing her money. She's a hardworking woman. So they get into an argument. She tells him, I want you out. That's it. I can't deal with you anymore. You're out of control. You got to get help. She tells him to get out. He goes into the kitchen and picks up a carving knife and just, you know, stabs her up multiple times. She dies. He panics. He goes and he gets a garbage bag. He throws all his clothes. He takes a shower. He takes his bloody clothes and the murder weapon, puts it in a plastic bag. He And what he does is before he leaves the apartment, he leaves the door ajar, figuring one of her neighbors is going to see it and discover, or someone's going to discover. Mm-hmm. He jumps on the A train, he goes downtown, he gets rid of the bloody, he gets rid of the evidence, comes back three hours later, and the door is still ajar. No one's discovered her. Now he's got a problem, because now people see him gone into the building. He can't leave again. Yeah. So he goes into the apartment, he starts making phone calls, calls his uncles, calls the police, and then just jumps on the body, and that's where we walk in several hours later so he was convicted of first degree murder and i just recently checked and he's still in jail and that happened i believe in 1994 so he's you know he's been in there a long time and i think he should stay there for the rest of his life listen if you can do that to your mother a perfect stranger has no chance with somebody like that no absolutely not i actually had no idea that your name went on the toe tag so what information goes on the toe tag now you gotta remember, I'm retired 15 years and I worked <laughs> organized crime. I wasn't a homicide detective, although I did work on some homicide cases. Mm-hmm. It would probably, if memory serves me correctly, it would be my name, my shield number, my tax number, uh, my command, like what precinct it happened in. And then it would be the deceased information. And, and there's not a lot of room to write on that thing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's a cardboard tag, it's like an oak tag, you know, when you were a kid, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's rather small, you know, and you know, you got gloves on, you got to tie it around the person's big toe. Gotcha. Wow, that's so crazy. So when did you, uh, you said you had gone into uh, stuff that has to do with vehicles, right? Uh-huh, organized crime. Uh-huh. Organized crime. When? So when did you start that and how long were you in that for? I was, I, I was already with the department 10 years, but I was always, even when I was in uniform, I was always the guy getting into car chases. You know, I, I just, I knew what to look for. I grew up in a neighborhood where there was like a million car thieves. I worked in a gas station. Guys were always coming in trying to sell stolen cars, sell stolen parts. I knew what to look for. So I always made stolen vehicle arrests and I was lucky enough to get picked up by the auto crime division. And we worked a lot of cases with the mafia and chop shops and again, stolen vehicles being exported out of the country. But I mean, I got more gory stories if you want, because I know <laughs> the show isn't really per se auto theft. If people, if your listeners want to pick up my auto theft book, it's called Grand Theft Auto, um, the NYPD's auto crime division, which was loaded with stolen car stories and how to protect your car from being stolen. But if you want to stick to the gory stuff, you know, because, <laughs> because, of, because of your show, I, I, I got more stories. Yes, yes. I do love the gory details. So definitely go for it. Um, And yeah, and if you want to talk about some of the books you've written too, because I checked out some of your uh, stuff on Amazon. But yes, give me those gory details. (laughs) All right. So I'll tell you a funny one that's gory. So I probably had about six or seven years in the precinct and there was this rookie cop, nice guy, joined the police department. We're making small talk and I find out he was an undertaker and a mortician. I says, why did you leave that job? He goes, ah, I was bored <laughs> out of my mind. I don't want to do that before. But he did it for like, he came on late. Like he came on like 26, 27 years old. He wasn't like a kid, 20, 19, 20. So I says, do you know where you got to work? I says, I says, get, get, get out of this precinct. The NYPD has what's called the missing persons unit. Mm-hmm. It's a couple of detectives 
And basically what they do is people, like again, people expire all over the city and they wind up in the morgue, they carry no identification. So what, what, what missing persons does is they'll send a detective to the morgue every couple of days and they will fingerprint the dead. And they know what to do. He was explaining it to me. You got to, um, in, you got to get a, a like a butterfly needle and, and inject like saline solution into the person's finger. Yes, it plumps it back up. They plump it right to, to mm -hmm. roll the fingerprints, and they take pictures of their teeth and stuff. So he said, nah, I don't know if I, I go. You got to do it. You should be a detective. Blah 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 blah. Sure enough, one day he says, "I'm going to the missing persons unit. I really appreciate the advice. Thank you." I said, "Great." The NYPD's got 35 to 40,000 members at any given time. Sometimes you, you, you work with a guy, you'll never see him again. If they go to work in another borough, another unit, it's just that big. Yeah. I lost track to this guy for like 15 <laughs> years. Like I was almost retired. And uh, my old partner, well, that's a good story. My old partner, we used to call him cancer because he killed more people than cancer. He <laughs> says to me, he, he says, he goes, I know a guy who knows you. I said, oh yeah, he goes, I had a toothache over, he says, I had a toothache the other day. He goes, I made an appointment with the union, you know, one of our dentists. He goes, I go to see this guy. He goes, and we're making small talk. And I tell him where I work and I'm in auto crime. And he goes, oh, do you know Vic Ferrari? He goes, yeah, that's my partner. He goes, yeah, I used to work with him in the 50th precinct. So then and my partner goes, wait a minute, you were a cop first? <laughs> he goes, yeah. He goes, and now you're a dentist? He goes, yeah. So he goes, listen, tell Vic anytime. So anyway, so my partner thought it was funny. He didn't know the undertaker part. So my partner comes in, he goes, listen, he goes, this guy says anytime you need dental work done or something, he goes, <laughs> go see him, you know? And I said, and I'm saying to myself, this guy's gotta have an IQ off the charts to become an undertaker, right? Which <laughs> probably is a lot of work and a lot of schooling. Definitely. Then, then to go through all the crap to become a New York City police officer, then to become a detective. Then to go to school and become a dentist, you know? <laughs> so I so my partner goes, here's his card. I says, I don't want it. He goes, why? I says, I like him a lot. I think he's a good guy, but knowing where his hands have been, I don't want him roaming around. <laughs> <in the house." laughs> so I, ne I never took him up on it. Great guy, but I, again, I didn't know. That's, I think, a story from my book, uh, NYPD Law and Disorder. But yeah, there's more to that story. But yeah, he was an undertaker, became a cop, then became a dentist. That is so funny. Cause I mean, they're, they have like kind of similarities. I mean, you kind of look at people's teeth, but there's a difference between looking at a dead person's mouth and then, you know, trying to do a cleaning on an alive person. I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> All right, I got another story for you. So this is in my book, uh, the NYPD's Flying Circus, Cops, Crime and Chaos. Um, early in my career, it's like a, it's like a, a Thursday night. It's pouring rain. It's slower than hell. It's like it's the same time of year, like this time of year, maybe October, raining out, very slow. Jo a, a call comes over as a domestic, so they give it to the first radio call, picks up the job there en route, and then the dispatcher says a couple of seconds later, "Listen, I'm getting multiple calls on that. Can somebody back up that sector?" So now it's slow. So now three cars are heading there, including myself. Well, the first cops that get there, it was a garden uh, garden apartment. So it's like three stories up, just like three story buildings. So they pull up, they're getting out of the car in the rain and they hear screaming coming out of the windows. So they're like, this has gotta be it. Mm -hmm. To this day, I have no idea why these guys did this, but it worked. Instead of going around the building and going, in, going through the front door, they decide to climb the fire escape to, to where they hear the sounds coming out of a window. Okay. Climb the, pouring rain. I mean, wow. they climb the fire escape. They look in the window. The woman is laid out on the floor. Her boyfriend is standing above her and he's cutting her head off with a carbon. <gasps> no they on way. The radio and they're screaming at the top of their lungs. You know, central, he's got a large knife. This motherfucker is stabbing the shit out of her. You know, get help. So now like we're fishtailing trying to get there as quickly as possible, right? We pull up on the other side of the building. We hear boom, 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 boom. Like eight, 10 shots go off. Like, oh shit. We go running into the building. As we're running into the, as we're going up the stairs, there's a little boy charging down the stairs and he goes, he's killing my mother. He's killing my mother. I go, wait down there. We get up the stairs. I think it was the second or third floor. It wasn't much higher than that. We're like, now we're trying to boom the door. We're kicking that door, kicking that door. 
and you hear, I hear our friends, the other cops, they're in the apartment like, don't shoot, don't shoot, because now they're afraid, friendly fire, we're gonna panic yep. and start shooting through the door. Like, yep. don't shoot, don't shoot, it's okay. They opened the door and it was like something out of a movie. The first thing I noticed was there was so much gunpowder in the room. It's like somebody lit off a couple of packs of firecrackers because a lot of gunshots in that apartment. Yeah. So she's laid out on the floor and her whole throat is gone. Like basically her spine is holding her head to her body. Yep. And there's a hole in her head. Everything in that, he, this guy knew he was gonna die. He knew he was going to hell. Bef before he tried to decapitate her, he took that hammer and he destroyed everything in that apartment, the toilet, the sink, the wolf. There wasn't one thing in that apartment that I was like, how did he have the time to do this? Like someone should have called the cops hours ago. This took a long time, the amount of damage. He, I had never seen anything like that before. So we walk, so he's dead. He's laying, he's laying um, kind of closer to the, to the window. What happened was, the cops are banging on the window, screaming at him to stop whatever he, you know, on top of her. He turns around with the carbon knife. Oh, you want some of this? He turns around, walks to the window, throws open the window and starts hacking at them with the carving knife. My two friends, if back then we had the 38s of the six shots, mm -hmm. they just unloaded, like they were like feet from this guy, like maybe two, three feet from this guy. They unload on him. I mean, you couldn't miss. They sent him spinning back into the apartment and when he fell backwards, when he, he hit the floor so hard, my friend told me, he goes, he goes, the knife bounced out of his hand, like slow motion and went end over end into the kitchen. And this is how cops think. Cop, cops really aren't afraid of getting killed. Cops are more afraid of getting in trouble. My friend just killed a guy that was stabbing a woman to death. And this is his mindset. He goes, all I could think of is I watched that knife sail into the kitchen. Is they gonna think I shot an unarmed man? I go, you got nothing to worry about. Oh. So, so um, we're walking around the apartment. I'll never forget this. As I'm walking around the apartment, my feet are sticking to the floor. There is so much blood from the damage he did to her, cutting, you know, basically decapitating her and stabbing her. I mean, she was stabbed up too. Plus he got hit. I think he was hit like eight, 10 times. He's bleeding all over the place. So, you know, our feet were sticking to the floor. The blood just was starting to coagulate. It was yeah. crunching. So he died, she died. We're at the hospital, the story gets crazier. We're at the hospital and uh, cops tend to wear like in, in smaller police departments, when you get your uniform, they'll send you to a tailor and the tailor will make that outfit, your uniform look good, it'll fit you. The NYPD, they're like here, you know what I mean? Like it's not form fitting. Small, so medium, go, large. <laughs> oh yeah, it's terrible. Unless, unless you're gonna spend the money for a tailor. Most cops pants are baggy. <laughs> so my friend that, that killed this guy, he said, we were in the hospital. He's getting checked out to make sure he's fine. He looks at his pants, the carving knife, when that guy was swinging, just nicked his pants. Didn't hit skin, but blew a hole through the side of his baggy pants. Wow. Well, and that's scary too, because you got your femoral artery there in your legs and one nick, you know, you got to go directly to the hospital. Said, so that other homicide I told you about, the um, the kid that stabbed his mother to death, mm -hmm. the cop I was working with was killed that way. Um, Vinny Gadis, great guy. He went on a domestic, this is, he's probably about a year or two after that incident that I was with, a really nice guy. Went on a domestic with his partner and they went to, it was a domestic and they were, I, I, I don't exactly know how it went down, but the bad guy either broke a mirror or threw a mirror at them. I don't know how, but there was broken glass on the floor. And when they were struggling with this guy, a shard of glass got him in his femoral artery. Oh. They got him to the hospital in time and they put him in this like a compression suit. Mm -hmm. to keep his blood and everything. But, um, you know, he, he, he expired that night. I think he had a heart attack. He died very young, like probably early 30s. Oh, wow. And yeah, that's a horrible insane. way to go. You know, yeah. you're responding to a call, trying to help people out. But it's interesting, though. My dad is a he's a sergeant with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. He's not retired yet, but um, he's told me a few stories like that. And he was telling me about how domestic calls are probably the, the highest chance of violence towards the officers. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's scary. That's really scary. Did you ever... Did you yourself have to do any of those domestic calls? Oh, sure, yeah. Before I went into plant calls, yeah, all the time. And I mean, 
it's an art to handle. Your dad will tell you it's an art to handle. And like, you want to stay out of the kitchen. You know what I mean? Sometimes you even want to walk them into the hallway because you're, it's like home field advantage. You know what I mean? Yep. I mean, they know where everything is in that house. If there's a yep. weapon in the house or they know that there's cooking oil, warm cooking oil on the stove, they're going to use it. So you're right. I mean, there's an art to handling domestics. You want to wash their hands. You don't want their hands in their pockets. You try to keep away from things. You maybe give them a good pat down first and, and have them sit on a chair. You know, it's, um, they can get ugly really quickly. I'll, I'll tell you a wild story. It's not domestic, but in the, uh, in the early nineties, you know, I, I was a young guy and we were going to bars and meeting girls and stuff. And, um, my old partner, this guy Cancer, his old partner, before I worked with him, was an amateur magician. So we're at the bar awesome. talking to the ladies, and this guy comes over, he starts pulling flowers out of his wrist and pulling <laughs> coins behind the ear. Essentially, he's cock blocking us with magic. So <laughs> I, I turn to my old partner and I go, Would you get him the fuck out of here? Like, how do you compete with this guy, right? Right. <laughs> so he goes, You know, he goes, It's funny you should say that. He goes, Because I wish he took his NYPD career as serious as he does making balloon animals on the weekend. So one night, <laughs> Um, they get called out to work. They're working at midnight. It's a calls for help in a six story uh, walk up building in the basement apartment. They get down there, they go into the basement. There's two doors. They go to door number one, they bang on door number one. Nobody answers. My old partner, who's an active cop, goes to bang on door number two. And the magician, who's lazy, goes, Nah, come on. We made enough noise down here. It's midnight. Our radios are on. Whoever, if anybody called the police, they would have come out by now. Don't knock. My old partner goes to knock again. He goes, come on, I'll buy a cup of coffee. Let's get the fuck out of here. So they leave. What they don't know is behind door number two, the super of the building was selling coke out of the apartment. He falls behind with his wholesaler. Now in the drug world, when you owe money for drugs, they don't sell, they don't cancel your cable or send friendly notices. <laughs> There's no repo. <laughs> right. They send a couple of Albanian hitmen to kill this guy. Oh, yeah. So what happens is it's an old gypsy trick. They brought an attractive female with them. And what they do is they knock on the door and they put the girl in front of the peephole. Guy sees a woman there. He's selling drugs. He figures, oh, this is great. He opens the door. They push her out of the way. They rush into the apartment. They're pistol whipping him. Where's the money? Where's the drugs? He doesn't have the answer. Long story short, they shoot him in the head. They roll him up in a carpet. They pull him out of the apartment and they throw him in the, in the furnace of the building. While he's going up like a fire log, the three of them go back into the apartment and they're ransacking it to see, did he have any stash? Is there any money in here? Yeah. That's when my old partner and the magician are outside ready to knock on door number two. So they're in the apartment they go, oh shit. So they tell the girl who's in on this. Like, it's not like they, she was forced to go. They tell her, listen, this is the deal. If those two cops knock on the door, this is what we're going to do open the door and just start yelling in Yugoslavian, which they're not going to speak and keep pointing to the kitchen and walk them down the hallway to the kitchen. When you get past the threshold of this bedroom door, throw yourself on the floor. We'll come out around. We'll shoot the cops in the head. We'll throw them in the incinerator and we'll get the fuck out of here. Well, they never knocked on that door. So anyway, the super had family. So about a week later, people are looking for this guy. The family, you know, is, is you know, where's our, where's our uncle? Where's my brother? The detectives get involved and they see there's a 911 call to that apartment. So they bring in my old partner, the magician, like, did you knock on that door? And like, no, we knocked on this door. Was anything suspicious? No. But my old partner said, you know, it's funny. When we were leaving that building, I noticed there was a, a car parked on a fire hydrant. So I gave it a parking ticket. Well, that was a getaway car and it belonged to the female. Wow. So with that parking ticket, they were able to bring the female in. She starts spilling her guts, trying to, of course, distance herself from what she did. Yeah. They picked up the two other guys and they solved the homicide. Then they had to go back to the building in February and shut the heat off for like two days for that, for that furnace to cool down, that they could get his skull and bones out of there, which everybody was pissed off because they were freezing their ass off because it's like in February. And that, that story is in my book, NYPD Through the Looking Glass, stories from inside America's largest police department. <laughs> wow, wow, this is awesome. So how many, so how many books do you have published and, and when did you start publishing? I've written six books, four of which are NYPD themed. They all, all my books have short stories from my NYPD career. I've written two others, one, one called Confessions of a Catholic High School Graduate, 
which is, is the picture of a Catholic high school kid getting chased out of a confessional by a priest, which really happened to me because sometimes confessing one sin too many can lead to a foot chase. <laughs> I, when I retired from the NYPD, my friends started, you know, you got to write books. You got all these wild stories. You know how to tell a story. Why don't you, why don't you write these books? And I said, yeah, I guess I should. And I was a little apprehensive at first, but once I started writing them and they started selling, I was like, well, I got a second career now. Yes. Hopefully your dad is going to be one of my customers. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. When I told my parents about it, they were so excited. Um, I had actually pulled up that clip that you sent me in the email and my dad, he was picking up on the language that you were using. It was, it was really oh, when great. I did the thing with the guy from Live PD? Yes, yes. When yeah, you were yeah, talking yeah. about the supers and everything, and my dad was saying, oh, that's the lingo for superintendent and stuff like that. So your dad from New York? No, not from, actually my mom's from New York, but my dad, he's a Florida native, but he's been with the Palm Beach Sheriff's Office for I think 20, 25 years now. He's about to retire in about six yeah. years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he took his sergeant's exam and he stayed there. He thought about taking the lieutenant's exam, but he's like, nah, it's just, it's too much work. They would have started me on the night shift. Cause I'm sure you know that uh, they, you have to have the day shift positions open in order for you to work day shift right but you know if you take the lieutenant's exam and pass and there's only you know the midnight open you're stuck on midnight for how many months years he was mentioning that the reason he didn't want to do that is because all those lieutenants were younger they weren't going to be retiring anytime soon so he would pretty much be stuck on midnights from now until he retires in six years so right now he's doing transport um he was i forgot what his position was but he was in court a few times he actually he ended up on the front page of the newspaper because he was uh in one of the during a trial that had happened down in south florida but yeah your stories are fascinating i will definitely be linking your books in uh, when i publish uh this video slash i'm sure I, i'll be able to upload the audio but it looks like we're about to run out so if you want to go ahead if you have any like social media promotion for your books or anything else that you're working on that you want to self-promote, uh, go ahead and do that. And then we could just wrap this up. Sure. So I've written, I mean, this is the, your show obviously is crime related. You don't usually you wind up in the morgue because something bad happened to you. So <laughs> yeah. I'll just talk about my NYPD books. We're, we're using the video on this podcast, right? Yes. All right. So here's, here's NYPD through the looking glass stories from inside America's largest police department. The NYPD's Flying Circus, Cops, Crime, and Chaos. Oh, I like NYPD, that. NYPD, Law and Disorder. <laughs> and this one near and dear to my heart, Grand Theft Auto. The NYPD's Auto Crime Division. All my, if you go on Amazon, all my books are paperback. They're between 225 and 240 pages. They're 10 bucks. I try to keep the price point low. There's no beginning, middle, end. They're just loaded with stories from my NYPD career, practical jokes that happen behind the scenes stuff, crime stories, and all, all of them are available. $2.99 ebook download. And if you want to get a hold of me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at VicFerrari50. Awesome. All right. And final thing before we wrap up, do you, as a retired uh, officer, what do you have as some easy safety tips that uh, we and the listeners could utilize to keep themselves from ending up as one of the, one of your morgue stories? Choose your friends wisely. No good thing happens after 11 o'clock. You know, it's funny. My cousin, when she, uh, my cousin's 18 years younger than me, and when, when she turned 18, 19, I got her a car. And I said, you know, it's great now you have all this responsibility and freedom, but now you gotta live your life differently. She goes, what do you mean? I says, you go over to your girlfriend's house and you get out, you know, Sunday night, 11 o'clock at night, don't stop to get gas. No. Don't, don't think, oh, this is great, I'll, I'll vacuum my car. That's where bad people hang out. I mean, they, they're, just, they're just hanging around, waiting for you to slip up to make it easy for them. You know, always be aware of your surroundings. Um, you know, watch people's hands when strangers come up to you. The hands is going to be what's going to hurt you. So watch their hands, watch their body language. Get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Well, I got a 120 pound Irish wolfhound running around here somewhere. So I would feel bad if somebody broke in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bad on them. But you know, that's what happens when you're breaking into someone's house. 
expect the unexpected. Correct. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Vic. This was so awesome. Thank you for reaching out to me. It was such a pleasure getting to hear all your stories. I'm sure we could easily set up another Zoom yeah, call you just for you. Absolutely. Anytime. Anytime you want me back, just reach out and I'll have more stories for you. Awesome. Definitely. I'll be reaching out to you soon. So thanks so much. The, the clock is ticking down at the, the final minute. So thank you so much. I'll be reaching out to you again soon. Thank you so much. And tell your father I said hi. Oh, definitely. Have a good one, Vic. Take care. Bye-bye.